Stasis Bone Totem opens up with two sea salvagers coming up on a deep sea ocean rig with no radio signals, no call for help, no signs of life. Something has happened in the deep and like sphere, Deep Star 6, Leviathan, and a number of other underwater horror or sci-fi stories. This involves something wicked in the deep, and it has a very Call of Cthulhu style feel at first, but then warps into something much different than I expected. The game's a point-and-click game at its heart, but it's got a unique setup. Three protagonists that let you switch between them seamlessly, as well as transfer items back and forth between them working through their own locations and experiences, and then coming together and apart again within the story. Two of the main characters have particular skills that they can adjust items in your inventory with consistent contact between them. And that's one of the first games where the separation of the characters didn't feel like a damn D&D game that's gone astray and the paladin just runs off on their own, but instead a true story about a group going about different goals. A husband and wife team who own a vessel, and no lie, they are backed up by a Teddy Ruxpin AI-driven fluffy bear with the ability to hack PCs like Elite Hacker. It reminds me forcibly of Chloe's bear in The Longest Journey, Dreamfall, and it works awesome. Like many point-and-click games, though, Bone Totem is built on its puzzles. In this way, Bone is surprisingly, almost refreshingly devoid of moon logic puzzles. You can figure some of them out just by clicking in places during a puzzle sometimes, and perhaps even progress in that way, but the ability of the characters to take special actions, for example, Mac's ability to smash down and break them into separate parts, means you almost always have some action you can take. Overall, the logic is actually pretty locked down, and the game has you thinking and rethinking ideas. One of the best parts is almost all the puzzles are tantalizingly sensible. You come into them and almost instantly understand maybe one or two parts. It's that last part that you need to figure out, and that means the game consistently feels like you're moving forward. Even when stymied, the idea of sort of messing things up and the teamwork between these characters and having them have their own skills means there's almost always some new idea. That also means that if you're stuck, you may switch items to Charlie, who can combine two items into a new one, which in many ways also seamlessly interfaces and interlaces her ability directly with her husband's. Moses is the Berenstein bear hacker of the group, who hacks and comes in pretty handy, because in the future time, which isn't explained exactly in the game's narrative, you realize that Moses is way more than he appears at first, which I'll explain in a bit without spoilers. Speaking of appearance, though... Stasis Bone Totem delivers exactly what I expected from a point-and-click adventure, a set of very nice, tight, and detailed series of locations, and most of them use multiple layers of small movement and particles to make them appear busier, but all of them are detailed and actually look great for a point-and-click adventure game. Surprisingly, the cutscenes are also a series of tight shots moving the game forward. Smartly, the devs have kept most of the cutscenes tight up on the characters' faces when showing their action, though wider scenes of descriptive action are pulled back. And this makes it easier to see who's doing what, especially when it's underwater where distance equals difficulty seen as that murkiness is increased. This is exactly the level I expected from this dev. It's excellent, smart work and design of their environments to continue to be immersive and interesting to what the gamer wants to see without being too difficult to identify the interactive elements or think pieces. This is also a result of their ping system. The right mouse button shows you green and blue nodes within the game world, with green being information and blue being interaction, or a deep look at an item. Merging that with the multiple character movement and interaction is a nice working system that's not too cumbersome, but is very interactive. I will say that for some reason, double clicking on the blue nodes only walks you up to them. You have to sort of wait and click a single time to actually look closer at the puzzle or item. Perhaps that's just to spare you misclicks or some kind of bug with the game. It didn't impact me, but I noticed I wasn't interacting with some of the items until I actually full on just clicked once. I like almost everything about the look and the performance, and it's right in line with what you would expect from a larger number of options that we get now in a lot of point and clicks when it comes to graphics. With a 1080Ti, 1440p with most settings cranked, it was well above 60. Design-wise, the characters are also very cool, aside from the bear. The bear is going to be hit and missed. Most bears look like bears. Most AI best friend bears should look like good friends of children, if that's what they are. I don't know what they might look like in this world, but it's a freak show. The goddamn kids in the future are born again hard if they're allowing these pets to be in the room. Because the first time you really see this gnarled-looking SOB, it's like a damned hair golem. We've worked with bodies before. So far, there's been So far? Why? I'm sorry, Mac, but you know I'm right. You know without this, we're at a dead end. 
But regardless of that oddity, I like the presentation. And presentation for point and clicks is a lot about what you interact with. And that's what I want to talk about the NPCs and the story itself. Many times we can have different favorite NPCs in games. You meet and a long list of games that we talk about with unique voices, characters, and narratives in those titles that are all memorable. Bone Totem's strength is that everyone there is there to tell the story. Just by happenstance, most of the characters you read about or meet are in some way related to the disaster itself. They're at the bottom of the ocean, so it's not like they wandered off the beaten path somewhere to get there. That means that each character's story you encounter is directly tied to what happened or the result of what happened. Not unusual, but this is where the developers excelled in moving the story forward. Each PDA you find has just enough information to give you a complete idea of the character, but an incomplete idea of what's happened overall. An intriguing narrative jigsaw puzzle where you follow each page and email and part, unlocking a bit of information about another one. So many times PDA entries and information is dry or useless or flavor fixed with some kind of breadcrumb bit that you follow to the next one. And it always feels like they're parsing out data way too lean. But for the most part, and the best part about Bone Totem is that each bit of story is important because these guys aren't fiction writers. They're not sitting down to journal about unicorn stories. Many are oil derrick workers. And for that, I really do thank the devs for doing it. Now, one of the more unique elements of this game I got to talk about is the occasional death scene played out if you don't think and sort of put your plans together correctly. It's an awesome way of handling this game. So often in a lot of games, you just can't do anything in this game. Sometimes if you make a mistake and you put things together in the wrong way, you almost get a fatality. I was surprised the first time it ran. It's not that this hasn't been done or characters haven't been able to die before, but this was something that just had me cracking up, especially because it's not always dire. I won't spoil the rest, but that is a amazing narrative slant and it really worked in this game. Another highlight to the game is the soundtrack, which has a nice series of themes like this horn driven central theme when you finally get to the ocean floor. And I definitely feel like it tries to get as close to a big budget movie as they could with limited resources. Surprisingly, it actually nails a lot of the energy and the weight of that trip, as well as what they were aiming for. Voices are also pretty good. For example, the main lead is this big gruff, a little like what you would first hear Geralt in The Witcher sound like. And you sort of try to figure out what high school theater troupe he belongs to. And then you realize, shit, man, I sort of like this guy. But the other leads are very good as well, with the handy mechanic Build-A-Bear randomly repeating warnings and child safety precautions, slowly giving you the idea of his role in the child's life. But the top-tier actress who takes a secondary part of the main lead and does an excellent job showcasing a person trying to get on with a life that doesn't feel like it might be worth getting on through. Two or more people sharing everything from the responsibility to the fear and regret when they're in a relationship. If there's one problem I have, it's that one of the main characters hymns and haws and breathes hard into the mic a lot the entire time, in fact. And it sounds like they're constantly under attack and stressed out. Now that's awesome, except no one ever else really does that, or they do it very rarely. So it sounds like the direction for the recordings were a bit different for one character than the others. And this could be explained as just a stressed out character, but there was something about it that just felt like it was happening at times when it might not need to. And it was a little bit odd to listen to that. Sound effects are also excellent from submerged discussions between one character hyperventilating inside of a deep sea diving mask and the processing there and another one investigating a zombie shark that just might actually be ready to come back to life. It's not bad at all. It's a ton of layered audio, just as you would expect. Huh? Look at these drawings. I like these. They are pretty. You and I have very different definitions of pretty. There are some things I didn't like in this game, though. First, the audio needs to be mastered or layered better on that original default setting. You can adjust the options, and there's a good number of them, which is great, because it can be rough trying to parse the background from the foreground and the voices. Also, at times, there were the occasional recording of the voices that sounded a little bit like they turned away from the mic like this and talked and then came back. You could say, hey, they're on mics, so that's just replicating what's really happening. You could say that, but a lot of times it's just a character actually standing there facing straight up talking to somebody. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's just a tiny note that I ended up pulling from the game. Bounding between characters is awesome. The back and forth of travels minimize for the most part as a great deal of puzzles fit directly in line with wherever one character is sort of resting until they can move forward because somebody else did something. But there were a couple of times where I did find myself realizing what I needed to do and thinking to myself, damn, man, I got to walk back there. 
Also, if you are a person who's played a lot of these games, while the puzzles don't have moon logic, and thank God they don't, I do think that some of them skew on the average to easier side. Aside from a couple that did have me thinking, what am I doing wrong? Luckily, the game's desire to make you feel like these characters that you inhabit and pay attention to what they're seeing and doing means that you actually pull in their information and you have to play the game like you are them versus looking like an overseer or some kind of movie director. Tight pacing helps with that. All of these factors come into place to really identify if Stasis is a type of title that a point-and-click adventure fan may enjoy. And for me, it was a blast. I like point-and-click games, but many are either too dry or model themselves after very highbrow horror games or sci-fi games. And that mixed with logic that has you using an elbow connector, jockstrap, and two sticks of gum to somehow make an explosive can feel like it's lesser than. Stasis Bone Totem, weird as that name is, has this awesome forward movement to it, a game offering a story that's interesting but not requiring that you sit and listen to two hours of some underwater creature's exposition about the murky depths and humanity throwing trash in the sea. This is more like Cthulhu Light, though hilariously some of the narrative descriptions on items and spot in the game skew totally closer to something H.P. Lovecraft would write if he was testing out his brand new thesaurus. Point-and-click games are such a well-established genre, and while Stasis Bone Totem isn't an instant classic, it's easy use, unique character abilities, fatalities, and well-delivered story backed up by very fun puzzles has to get a couple nods of appreciation. Fundamentally, many hinge on their surprise, and while I won't go into that either for or negative just because of the spoilers, I have to offer my appreciation for a game that, while some of the locations may be fanciful, it has puzzles that are well-grounded in the same fiction that the story exists in leading weight to the entire game. My rating is a buy. Subscribe, patron, gang, gang. This is not safe for children to eat. Look at that. Food's still on the plates. Yeah. They left in a hurry. Gordon. Kitchens can be dangerous places. Utensils, sharp objects, and powered equipment should always be stored safely. 